In this video, I'm going to take you through the research design process that sociologists go through when designing their research and designing studies that they're going to conduct. We're not going to look at all aspects of the process in detail in this video, and there will be additional videos for those sections that require a little bit more detail. But what we will do is outline the hypothetical deductive model and why it's used. And we'll also talk um, in more detail about the factors affecting choice of topic, background research, hypothesis and research question and pilot study. The last few stages of the research design propose, uh, process or the research process itself are about the conducting of research and we will talk about that but not in as much detail. So let's start off with talking about the hypothetical deductive model. Now, this is the method that is preferred by positivist sociologists because it's creating a hypothesis and trying to prove it or disprove it, as the case may be. And it is a it follows a very similar plan to the process used by the natural sciences. So positivists will see this as a scientific approach. Now, interpretivists will use a similar process, but they won't use in one of the steps, and I will talk about that when we get there, but in one step, rather than creating a hypothesis to prove or disprove, they prefer inductive reasoning, where they collect their data first before making any conclusions or assumptions. So we're going to go through the whole process, and I'm going to talk about each step um, a little bit more detail, but just to give you an overview, there are nine steps to the hypothetical deductive model. The first being to choose a topic, issue or problem to investigate. Slightly obvious, you can't design research if you don't know what you're going to be researching. Once that's been done, gathering background research and we'll look at the reasons why a um, sociologist or a researcher would do that as part of the design process. Then the development of a hypothesis or question. So the positivists would prefer the development of a hypothesis, whereas interpretivists would prefer the um, a, a research question that they can investigate and develop. You then then deciding on methodology and sampling frame. Now this is one of the areas that we will look at in a separate video. Both methodology, choice of methodology and sampling will be separate videos, but I'll give you a little bit of information about that when we get to that stage. Then the conducting of a pilot study. Again, this doesn't have to be um, exact. Some sociologists will do a pilot study, some will not. Some may do this, the pilot study and realise that the, there's no reason to do the main study. These last four stages, uh, the conducting of research and collection of data, the analysis of the data, drawing conclusions and evaluating the study. Although a part of the research process, they're not part of the design process. They're the carrying out of the research. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those. Um, just to let we'll just go through what they are, what they mean and how they're done briefly. So if we start off talking about choosing a topic, issue or problem to investigate. So sociologists have a wide gamut of topics that they're interested in. They're interested in um, what we refer to as social problems, which are social phenomena or behaviour that requires a collective response from society. And as a collective, society sees this behaviour as abhorrent or deviant in some way. They're also interested in sociological problems, which is any form of behaviour, positive or negative, that requires an explanation where people want to know why. What is happening? Why is it happening? But researchers have to consider a number of factors when choosing what their research is going to be on. The first being their own personal interests. Research can be quite all encompassing. It can take over. 
and sociologists or researchers in general really oh, aren't really going to take on a research project or a piece of research if they haven't got an interest in that particular area. Maybe it's a topic area that they have been researching for a long time and they have um, and they're developing further and they have a connection to it might be a topic that they have a personal connection to something that has happened to them that they're trying to explain or explore um, it could be something that they've experienced that they want to explain or explore so the, a researcher's personal interest is going to be a big factor in determining what they are going to study they also need to think about their political beliefs and theoretical perspective because different theoretical perspectives such as functionalism, Marxism, feminism, interactionism, all of these different perspectives will view social problems and sociological problems differently. They may see one social phenomena as something that needs explaining but not something else. For example, functionalists in the new right look at divorce and think that's something we need to investigate. We need to find out why divorces are increasing and what is leading to people getting a divorce. Whereas postmodernists wouldn't be as inclined to research this as they don't see it as a problem. They see it proof that people have more choice over their lives, that people are able to pick and mix the type of life that they want and they can change their life at any stage should they choose to. So depending on political beliefs, depending on their theoretical perspective, sociologists will have different views on what phenomena requires their investigation. You also need to think about opportunity and access. Some research topics will come up suddenly or an opportunity will arise within a particular social group or within certain phenomena excuse me where it wouldn't be necessarily something the researcher would consider looking at but it's kind of like oh wonder why that's happening or oh that's that's interesting I'd, I'd like to look into that further so it does link into that personal interest but certain topics will land in their lap so to speak but they also need to think about access to participants and are they going to be able to access the participants they require in order for this study to take place? Are, there, are these people within a closed community or a closed group that wouldn't ex accept outsiders? Um, are they less than trusting of outsiders? Things like that. So are they going to be able to find people within the research population that they want to research? Are they looking at something that's perhaps a secret or hidden? For example, some sort of sexual fetish or kink, um, not something people advertise about themselves. So it could, could cause issues in accessing your participants. Funding is an important one. Funding bodies um, that are external to universities um, or government will have a specific focus. If they're a charity, a business, um, a non-profit organisation, anyone like that who is willing to fund research will have specific areas that they want the research to take place. Um, so, for example, a children's charity wouldn't really be interested in, say, secularisation whereas they might be more interested in the changing status of childhood over time. So it, where, whoever is funding the research will have an impact on the specific topic that is being researched. There are very few, if any, researching grants or, or um, funding where it's a bit of a free for all and the researcher can do whatever they like. Society and in vogue topics. What we mean by this is what is popular at that time, because what's popular is going to attract more funding. If it's something that the wider society is interested in and something that they are um, 
wanting to know research funding will become available it will be made it, it it's what needs explaining at that time so it kind of links in with that opportunity um, factor but the more in vogue or more popular the topic the more likely you are to get funding so for example post 9 11 post uh, july 7th all of those events created a wealth of new funding in understanding extremism and terrorism and what leads people to join these fundamentalist groups so when society as a whole is interested in what's going on it can open up new avenues of funding it can open up new opportunities for a researcher and finally they need to think about the ethics and sensitivity of the topic now i've already mentioned about um, the study of extremism and what causes people to join these groups straight after 9 11 it would not have been appropriate on November, uh, september the 20th for example for a researcher to start looking into interviewing people who had been impacted by 9 11 because it was still quite raw it was still quite new and people were grieving even if they hadn't lost somebody they were still grieving because it was a tragedy that occurred and it was felt worldwide so the research is going to need to think is this a, the appropriate time for me to do this research is this topic too sensitive in nature to be researched at this time okay. now different researchers will place weight on different factors and some will be more important than others so there's no one factor that's really more important than the others except in your own kind of belief or your own opinion okay but all of these factors will play a part in the choice of topic issue or problem that is going to be investigated in the research and it has to be determined right at the start because otherwise you've got nothing else to plan around step two is the background information and what the research is doing here is they are looking at what has come before what do we already know about this topic and they'll do this for a number of reasons there are a number of reasons why a researcher will do this background research they might do it oh, where's my pen gone? because um, they want to see whether their research is worth worth it okay so by doing the background research they can find out if we've already answered the question um that they're, they're investigating are they have they already found out everything there is to find out or is there something that they can add to what's already happened it helps to formulate the hypothesis um so looking at what other researchers have found out looking at what is already out there the researchers are able to determine what they think they're going to find okay so can they add anything to what we already know or to what's happening they also want to do it to avoid plagiarism so they want to avoid copying somebody else okay so if they conduct the research in the same way that somebody else has done and they've already published there is a possibility of accusations of plagiarism but the research but the background research is really important to to the sociologists who's designing their research because and particularly because they want to find out is it worth doing is this research going to 
add anything to our understanding of society. If it's not, then they won't get funding. And therefore, it's not worth doing. So then we move on to step three. And this is the idea of developing a hypothesis or question. Now, as I said before, the development of a, high, of a research question comes usually from the interpretivists. Okay. And they believe in inductive reasoning or induction, where they gather all of the information first and then come to a conclusion. Whereas a hypothesis is linked to the positivist who take what they believe, believe to be a more scientific viewpoint. And this is where they use deduction. So this is when they create a hypothesis that can be tested and then either supported or refuted by evidence. So they're, they're kind of saying, this is what I think I will find. Let's see if I can find it. Whereas the in interpretivist and the inductive model, they create a question, more of a, a vague kind of well, not vague, I guess, but more of a kind of, I want to find out about. And then they go and research it and they find out what they find out and then they make a conclusion. Whereas the positivist kind of would say, this is what I'm going to research. This is what I think is going to, I'm going to find out based on background research, uh, prior knowledge, things like that. I want to see if that's still the case. Okay. So depending on your theoretical perspective, you will de decide which way you're going to go. Step four is the deciding on the methodology and sampling frame. Now, as I said before, for both of these, we will be doing separate videos as they're kind of in depth and detailed. So with methodology, we're talking about the choice of research method that's going to be used. And they will look at the practical ethical and theoretical considerations when determining which methodology is the best one to use or best ones to use because they may use more than one to collect the data that they need for their research. The sampling frame is the way that they're going to choose their participants. So it might be that their research population is 100,000 people. Well, it's not possible to research, do research on all 100,000 people. One, they may not want to take part. And two, that's just not practical. So a researcher will need to determine a sampling frame. And that is the process they're going to use to select the people who are going to take part in their project, in, in their research. Now, as I said, we will look at both of these as separate videos, um, as it's a lot more in depth than I can do here. Stage five then is conducting a pilot study. Now a pilot study is a test run. It's where the researcher is practicing their study, so to speak to make sure that the data they're going to collect is accurate, it's valid, it's reliable, and they're actually getting the data that they need. Because if they do the full study and then realize, actually, we didn't find out what we wanted to find out in any way, shape or form, whether it was with a hypothesis or without, then they've wasted time and they've wasted money. But a pilot study also can help to determine whether or not it is worth doing the major study. So just like with the background research where they will look at whether or not it is appropriate um, to do the study and whether or not they can add to the prior research or information we currently hold, the pilot study does the same thing. But th at this point, they're just kind of seeing, can this work? And sometimes what they will find is when they do their pilot study, 
that they then don't need to do the main study. A classic example here is Milgram's study of obedience, where he did a, he was conducting a pilot study in um, America with the idea that he would then go to Germany to find out whether or not there was this German gene that led to people committing the atrocities of World War II. But having done the pilot study with half a dozen, a dozen people in America, and there were major issues with the study, not just ethical, he only ever he used men only and various other issues. But he realised that there was no point going to Germany and conducting the main study because it was clear that there was no German gene. And in fact, it was something more universal to people that led to the atrocities of the Second World War. But not every researcher will conduct a pilot study. Sometimes they may not feel it necessary with the background research that they've conducted, that the research, the, the pilot study is unnecessary. So they may just skip this step and head straight into the final steps. Now, as I said, the last four steps in the study, in um, the hypothetical deductive model are about the conducting and collecting of data, the analysing of data, drawing conclusion and evaluating the study. So this is not technically research design, this is the conducting of research. So when a sociologist conducts their research and collects their data, they may not be the actual person that does that. They may hire people, they may um, use PhD students or um, university students to help them. Excuse me. But obviously they're going to have to go out and collect data, whether that be primary or secondary. Once they have all their data, that's when we start bring, doing the analysis. And this will be looking for trends, commonalities, looking for those answers to the questions that they posed right at the beginning of the process. And once they've done their analysis, then they're going to be able to draw their conclusions. Whether it be a deductive or inductive reasoning, they're still going to be able to draw those conclusions. Within, with deductive reasoning, have they proven or disproven their hypothesis? With inductive reasoning, what does the data tell us? What does it show? And then they're going to evaluate their study. No study will ever be perfect because we're humans and our participants are humans. And there are too many variables that are beyond the control of the researcher in order to say that it's perfect. So the researcher will look at their study and pick out the places or the points where perhaps things weren't great or where people could nitpick at them, I guess, is the way to look at it. And they're going to try and mitigate those negativities by explaining why they why what they did was the best that could be done. Because you can't keep people in isolate, grow people in isolation um, where they have no access to wider world and you control every moment and every aspect of their life. Hugely unethical, vaguely illegal. Um, I think it might verge on child abuse for if you were to do it from birth. But this stage gives the researcher a chance to explain any elements of their study that they know were not perhaps as valid or as reliable as they wanted them to be. So that's the hypothetical deductive model and the process a researcher will go through when designing and conducting their research. Now, as I said before, in my next video, I'll be looking at the factors affecting research design and the choice of methodology. I will do a separate se uh, video on primary methods, secondary methods and on sampling and they'll be coming along shortly.